so funny. Every time I tell people from America I'm from Canada, especially on stage, immediately, hey, how's it going, Harry? You want a war? Or do you want to just give me a war? There's a new NBA champion, and it's a team from Toronto, Canada. This is the Pro Shooter Masala Podcast. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Prosciutto Masala episode. I think we're on seven now. Um, I'm really excited for this episode. I have a good friend of mine and a business associate uh, with us, um, Chris Adams. Chris, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So, Chris, tell everybody a bit about you, your kind of journey, uh, starting your own business and, and kind of the various businesses you've been through and, and um, yeah, being a kind of a small business owner. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I started in um, web development originally. Um, this was back in uh, 99, 1999, making uh, Yahoo uh, web pages for restaurants. Um, some pretty basic stuff. But uh, from there, I kind of went into small business coaching. Um, and then ultimately uh, started uh, about five years ago, started, well, six years now, uh, Canadian Shade, uh, which is our, well, which we work together on the uh, our awning company. Um, that's now pretty much taken over. We've we've now shut down the web development company and and um, kind of gotten into the contracting uh, contracting world. Uh, we've got a few staff uh, in in house. We're it's a it's an at home company, like no office or anything, but uh, we do quite well. So. Awesome. Well, if anybody needs awning or shade products, Chris is, uh, is the <laughs> yeah. best stuff. You can, we can for do sure. a shameless plug. That's what, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's what the plug. podcast is for. Exactly. <laughs> that's a plug. Just take it. So, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> one of the things I wanted uh, to have you on for, Chris, because uh, one, I, without blowing too much smoke up your ass, I, I really do respect you and I think you're a really intelligent guy and have some good opinions and, and great experience, especially in marketing and sales and business, um, is, is a topic on minimum wage, which... Um, I, I think it's interesting because I had read some stuff recently about, um, you know, kind of both sides of the argument from the business owner and the employee, um, where, you know, obviously uh, from first glance, you know, most people I think would agree that having a minimum living wage is, is more than reasonable. Um, <laughs> and But on the other side, I've heard some arguments from business owners that is like, you know, well, some jobs are maybe not even worth minimum wage. And I think it's a touchy subject. And I think it's it's important to, even for me being as a business owner, to to make sure you're obviously paying people a fair wage, but at the same time, not overpaying or, or not paying where you're not making a profit, right? So yeah. I know it's kind of a yeah. broad kind of um, spectrum of, of a conversation, but like, what are your thoughts, uh, your well, kind of general thoughts on, on minimum wage? In, in the business community, you're right. It's, it's an incredibly divisive topic there's there's two like you said there's two kind of opinions where um we like you said certain certain jobs are not worth they're not worth it even minimum wage um and then uh there's uh which i i believe that um you pay somebody well enough to live which is a living wage um there you're going to retain more people you're going to have a happier um, work environment which means more productivity um, and and you know they won't be kind of like one foot out the door or not really uh, care about your your mm-hmm. uh, the, the workplace which is what you need you need to cultivate some sort of when you start getting more than you know one or two staff especially larger companies um, the uh, the workplace culture becomes very important at that point. And if everyone's making minimum wage, nobody really cares. <laughs> yeah. So, and then that culture is contagious, right? So if, if the majority of people don't care, then everyone else is that might have cared is, is also not going to care. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the dollars and cents is, is the other side of it is, can you afford to pay, uh, you know, twenty dollars an hour um, to uh, to retail. You know, to a baristas at uh, mm-hmm. Starbucks, or um, or is it just not a, a business model that works? And those are kind of the two sides of it. And I guess like the the thing I struggle with is is I mean, 
is what what who decides what is worth minimum wage and what is not, right? Like I think there's definitely we'll all agree there's some skills like, you know, I think it's universally kind of agreed, like a doctor or a lawyer or things should be making um good money, you know, obviously much more than minimum wage, maybe a hundred, two hundred bucks an hour or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But then yeah. somebody like I heard the analogy where uh, a business owner was talking about he does uh research, market research for his business and Sometimes they're paying people to literally stay at home and count the amount of commercials that come on the TV. And there was a study yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd listened to, and I could probably link it in the show notes after, but most people agreed in that conversation that, yeah, that probably is not worth 15 bucks an hour. So it's, it's tough. It's like, what do you, who determines what skill is, is, is worth that and what skill is not, you know? Well, I mean, I, I feel ultimately the government is the one that has to set these sort of mandates in place like what whether we believe that that job is or isn't worth $15 an hour the fact is whoever is performing that job can't live on that wage mm-hmm. um so you know should the job even exist at that point is is there a point of 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 having that job um maybe you can take that job and bundle it with something else and create something more meaningful as a job which is not, I mean, that's not the way typically larger businesses go, right? We're, we're now in kind of a world of contract, uh, you know, contracts, one-year contracts, two-year contracts. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, businesses don't want to be locked in to, uh, to their staff unless they, you know, unless they've proven themselves. Um, and so, so job security really isn't, isn't there at all anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, in terms of uh, we talked about this a little uh, while before. Um, I think last time I was over at your place. Now it's going to be interesting to to see how this affects the kind of gig economy, and if the government's going to come out with regulations that you know uh, affect that. And it's it's I don't know the answer. Uh, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on on how it'll be affected. Well, I, I think the gig economy is you know relatively new, right? Like this this century, I guess, within the last decade. It you know Uber was what 2000. Four or five, somewhere, somewhere around. Was it that anyway, long ago? Okay, maybe. Yeah, it was a while. Um, okay. e- either way, it's it's a new eco- it's a whole new economy, starting with Uber and then kind of going into the restaurant delivery and and all of these other things. But um, the law is slow. You know, the political process is slow. So I think eventually. I mean, I, I know there's been discussions about it in government. Um, you know, I've read articles about. Uh, uh, politicians wanting to move to create, um, you know, because ultimately an Uber driver that does it full time or even part time is essentially an employee, right? If you get rid of all the semantics and 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 the you know uh, trying to work around it, mm-hmm. Uber requires these people to drive people around to make money. So mm-hmm. that. That is an, and, and, and these people have no other, which is an important, uh, in, in, uh, Canadian law anyway, is an important definition, um, between a, a small business and a, or a contracted employee and, uh, a small business is, um, whether they have one customer, like if you're a small business and you only have one customer, you're an employee of that of that business gotcha. that is that is just the way it works in in canada um whereas so if for you, example like if you're if you're a contractor and you get all your business from one company you're you're really even though they're paying you um as a contractor you're, in, you're typically an employee that you if it if it ever came to light and there was a dispute and it ended up in a, a court and and that's how they would treat it yes um, they also the government, you know, it's a taxes, uh, the CRA, they view it as that as well. Interesting. Um, so it's an important kind of, so, so with the gig economy, I, I do think that they'll, um, I think that it will eventually happen. Um, it's just a matter of, of time, you know, of when, right. Again, the law is slow. So. Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, yeah. Now, in terms of um, gig economy and minimum wage and, and, and cost of living and all that stuff, now, is there, in your opinion, um, and this is something I kind of struggle with, is there something else that can be done um, in regarding like overall economy, like with the cost of living now in Toronto, 
know, if you look back like 30, 40 years ago, you know, minimum wage was much less, but the cost of living was as well. So yeah. is it a greater problem where it's not just about raising the, um, uh, raising the minimum wage, it's about, you know, a, a whole bigger ecosystem of things. And maybe it can't be controlled. Maybe a city like Toronto, where you got people just coming here in, in floods because it's, it's one of the biggest cities in North America. You're going to have, that's going to happen with any, any city with supply and demand. I don't know. It will. Yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, it, you're right about regions. I mean, every region has a different, if you're, if you're living in a rural area, your needs or what we'll talk about, I guess, living wage versus minimum wage because living wage is really what you need to survive. Like what is the bare minimum living in Toronto to survive? And, now and I thought minimum, that they, they both were the same. No, well, no, okay. not in, not in terminology. Um, uh, minimum wage is what is legally. The best explanation I ever heard um, was from uh, actually from Chris Rock, the comedian. Okay, yeah, and and he said with minimum wage that what your employer is telling you is I would pay you less, but the law won't let me. <laughs> right, and that's your that's your minimum wage right there. That's your mandate, right? You 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 you're getting the bare minimum of what is required by law. Living wage. Is a little bit more abstract. A living wage is is what you um, what you basically need within a particular region to survive, you know, and that's kind of the difference between the two. Okay, Rob. The one thing that I will say is uh, he makes a good point because living wage. I've always thought the same thing. I thought for you know for the longest while, living wage was correlated directly to your out your uh, to the minimum wage. Um, and it wasn't until I started at my job probably three, four years ago when, you know, I'd go on our HR, you know, sites or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And the, ter- the the terminology always said living wage, living wage, living wage. It never said anything else. And and this was really for the people who were part-time workers at that time. I was just curious to see what, you know, the average wage was for a lot of the part-timers that we hired. And the, the, ter- the terminology was always living wage. It was never minimum wage. And when I looked more thoroughly into it, it was broken down into regions, it's, you know, which part of Ontario, which part of Quebec, which part of Alberta. It was broken down into sector. Um, Interesting. Because I think, yeah, as he said, I don't think minimum wage is something that's bad, but I think it's bad because it doesn't allow for aspiration to occur. Because, you know, when you get a job, young or old, you have certain goals in place, right? Um, and technically speaking from how I've always thought it, minimum wage kind of dictates the basic bare minimum for you to survive, um, Interesting. which might suffice for like a college kid. But then what happens when that college kid starts to have other goals in mind? Right. Then what do, what, then what do we do? Right. So it's, it, it's a tough one. It's a tough one because the minimum wage is there for a reason, but it doesn't allow, at least in Toronto, um, for it to evolve into anything else, right? So am I, I guess I right in assuming then, um, I don't know if either of you know that then living wage um, is then obviously slightly higher than than minimum wage and then living Absolutely. wage would be yeah. um, different across different regions in Ontario Absolutely. or across Canada, sorry? Yeah. I mean, because gotcha. I, I know for some of the younger kids that we hire at our company, um, and, and if you, if you were to compare Toronto to Montreal, um, the Montreal guys get paid a lot less, but then again, their cost of living is a much lower than ours. So it depends. Yeah. It depends how you look at it. It, it depends. Oh, how you would look at would it. living wage, um, be ever, I don't know, Chris, if you know this, would living wage ever be in certain parts of Canada lower than minimum wage or it, it, it could, could happen. Be. Yeah. That would oh, be wonderful. If that was true, that would be amazing. But I, 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 I think it would be a very rare uh, yeah. occurrence there's there's a there's a um there's a not-for-profit called the living wage ontario living wage network okay and they actually have a chart that what they now I, where their data comes from i'm not sure but uh but I, I tend to agree with it that um it breaks down different regions as to what would what what hourly would be required what would constitute a, a living wage um toronto for example is 22 dollars an hour versus that's, that's living wage that's living wage gotcha. versus like chatham would be 16 dollars an hour gotcha 
Um, and it just depends on, you know, rent in that area, just the, your kind of basic necessities, costs, all of that um, uh, rolled into what you need to make. And 15 is, is 30,000, $15 an hour is only 30,000 a year. Um, it's like poverty line. Well, uh, it, well, it is. It's it's just it is above the poverty. Okay, so that's a whole other. <laughs> we can get into it. We got time. What what constitutes the poverty line um, in in Canada? Really, um, I'm not sure. I mean, Stats Canada puts out what the poverty line is, and it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of ridiculous. Like twenty thousand dollars for a single person. In, in Toronto is considered p- poverty line. So if you're making 20000 or less, you're mm-hmm. below the poverty line. But that's, I still think there's, I think that's a little low to be considered poverty. I think if you're at 30000 yeah. what, what's the average mm-hmm. rent in Toronto? If, uh, even in the- Two grand, 2500 I'm guessing. Well, that's average. But even the, in the, the worst neighborhoods, you're looking at still a one bedroom for fifteen, fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600. Uh, that's- as eighteen thousand dollars a year, roughly, um, of your thirty thousand, which is also that's not thirty thousand. The tax is deducted, right? Mm-hmm. So you're actually only getting, you know, maybe twenty five take home pay. You've got seven thousand left over to pay your, you know, everything else, your mm-hmm. food, everything, and uh, entertainment. It's it's even fifteen an hour is not enough. It's not even remotely enough in Toronto. So back to, I guess, like m- my question was, like, can we, is there anything else other than obviously, you know, m- having the government mandate a certain minimum wages or living wages? Um, obviously, this is a, I guess, people go to school to study economics for, for years and years. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, and I find it very, it's funny, I never really was interested in economics class in, in like school. But as I get older and, you know, you run a business and you're affected by it. Um, yep. it, it's very interesting, right? Um, you know, specifically too, like I'm a, also fascinated on the whole idea behind, you know, taxing, obviously the rich, obviously, you know, a lot of politicians yeah. come in, oh, we're going to tax the rich and thing, but it's a slippery slope too, because it's a nice, it's a nice one liner, but not many yeah, people for actually sure. do it <laughs> to get elected. Right. But also it's, yeah, there's, yeah. there's, there's always a, an action and reaction, right? If you tax yeah. the rich too much, from my understanding, it's obviously like, you know, they, they should pay a bit more, but the problem is then they take their businesses and their corporations and their factories elsewhere where in places or states where they're tax deferred, right? So it's it's a cause and effect thing. And I think it's a very delicate balance between, you know, yes, they need to be, I think, pay their share, but you don't want to be taxing them too much because then they're just going to go elsewhere, right? I, 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 sort of uh, agree with that I, I think that in some businesses you're right o- over the long term they may look you know if they're looking to set up shops somewhere where they can be cheaper mm-hmm. um, or, or run their operation for less money but in general um, look we got a large customer base here for for, for people right it's not like mm-hmm. you know Walmart's not just going to pick up and leave Ontario because we raise the minimum wage, right? Because they're getting consumers. They're making hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue off of the people that are here. In fact, having a higher living wage may actually increase the amount of money or at least the sales revenue, even if their expenses are a little bit higher on the, uh, the labor side. Um, which, which is a drop in the bucket as far as the expense sheet. When you consider what, uh, like Walmart is paying for, you know, the land that they occupy and the merchandising and the cost of goods sold and all of that, mm-hmm. um, adding, you know, a few dollars an hour to the employee roster. It's a big number, but, but not in comparison to the rest of their expense sheet and their employees and every person in Ontario, if they're making a living wage, that means they're spending more on, on, uh, not just living ex- like things they need to survive, but on on everything else, which is going to increase the sales revenue of of the at least the local uh, small business, especially and mm-hmm. and uh, and even the larger corporations are going to make more money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I can't see it being a, a and, and let you when in, what you're talking about would be more of a manufacturing, you know. Potential. Yeah, I was going to say. I guess it depends on the business. It makes sense for something like Walmart. You kind of you know where your physical locations really. You know, you need to be in the big city centers, right? But somewhat yeah. something like 
I don't know if Amazon's a good example with their factories or like you said, manufacturing. Um, yeah. Is it more, um, a, is it more, a, what am I trying to say? A touchy subject or do you have to be more careful with taxation on those businesses um, specifically? Uh, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. I, I'm If I was, you know, Walmart, Walmart puts a lot of, I'm going to imagine, I don't know for sure, but there's a lot of criteria that goes into the selection process for where they put their warehouses. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that minimum wage is a factor with them. I, I believe they actually pay their employees more than minimum wage, even at the factory level mm-hmm. uh, in Ontario. Um, don't quote me on that. I don't know a hundred percent, but I'm, I'm pretty sure um, that they're not, they're not going by the minimum wage model anyway. Like they're not paying $15 an hour. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but with another company, a factory that is, um, and, uh, you know, we see this as a result of COVID that a lot of factories are having a hard time yeah. getting factory workers in Ontario mm-hmm. and they're complaining about it, but they're still only paying like $15 an hour. So, yeah. you know, if they you pay $20 that's, an yeah, hour, that's they, people are just kind of like happy staying at home collecting CERB rather than going back kind of yeah. and, yeah. and, and, and reductions in employment insurance, like the re- reductions on the, the, um, the qualifications you could work, you know, like four months and then, and then go on EI again. Mm-hmm. Right. There was like a, the minimum hours was reduced dramatically. Um, all of that means that more people could stay home if they wanted to and just collect money at home. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, at $15 an hour, if I can make nearly the same amount of money, maybe I could get a side hustle to make more if I had the time, or maybe I could start my own business, you know, mm-hmm. by going on CERB or EI. Um, I think a lot of people, people think, you know, oh, it's just these lazy people at home, but Mm -hmm. I, you know, especially the factories that want to pay the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, to look at it from a little bit more uh, of if if I was in that position, um, I'd take it as an opportunity and maybe start my own thing where I'm not making $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, take that risk because you've got the safety net of, of EI. Well, I feel like now you kind of have to like just looking at the cost, obviously cost of living. And it's it's not just, I think, a minimum wage thing, minimum wage, if it's even bumped up, you know, another five bucks, 10 bucks, like really you think about it, even, you know, if you're making, you know, uh, 60, $70,000 a year. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's okay money. But with the price of housing being a million bucks on average and the mm-hmm. cost of living being so expensive stuff, so really, you need to kind of feel like. Uh, you almost have to have a little side hustle or start something of your own because uh, just depending on one income or, uh, um, you know, one sole revenue source from one person, if you have a, a spouse or a significant other, that's obviously going to help. But I feel like now, like most um, young couples uh, and young people need to have two or three sources of income or um, you know, one or more person in the household making like over, you know, sixty, seventy thousand $70,000. Yeah, in Toronto for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, one, you know, a single person has it really hard. You you basically have to have a roommate, and you're you're renting, right? Unless you're you're in, you know, you're making a lot a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a a couple, a young couple with no kids actually is isn't too bad, but you're you're still not in the housing game, right? Mm-hmm. The housing game is just out of control in general, mm-hmm. um, in, in the major urban centers in Canada. Um, but, but you could rent and you could live relatively, if, you know, if you had two people making, you know, 50, $60,000 a year, that's, that's, that's actually like the top 10% of wages in Ontario is around there. I'm making, so, sorry, how, how much a year? Uh, 50, 60,000 a year. Okay. Two, two people together. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're talking 120,000. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's a sustainable, you know, or you get two single people who are roommates and they get together and, I do it but for that, that even it's still hard from my understanding like to, to afford a mortgage anywhere in the gta like i oh no my, house, housing is out there's, right? there's no there's no mo- most people who don't already own a home um are not in in even the running to mm-hmm. purchase unless they uh they have to be really frugal with their their um their money and save for several years just just for the down payment and then you're talking a five thousand dollar a month mortgage on a 25 year that's insane uh, yeah mortgage. yeah it's and- it's there's no there's no real way around the fact that uh, i have i have uh colleagues that they you know several years ago 
many moved out of the city. They bought in like, you know, Orangeville or so they're dealing with like hour, hour and a half commutes, which is terrible, but they bought out there so they could build their revenue in a house and then hopefully maybe move back into the city because they've got, you know, two, 300,000 in equity in, in a property and they can use that equity to kind of bring down the cost of a house in Toronto, but that's really the only way. And, and it's, it's kind of terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What I find interesting too about uh, when when we first started talking about properties with you, Chris, I know I think most people are kind of raised, you know, like you grow up, you you have a family, uh, you get kids, you get a house, and then you live happily after after, right? But it's interesting yeah. talking to you. You kind of changed my perspective on on housing, and I think it's a good thing to think about because I think a lot of people think, oh, if I if I don't own a property in my life, I'm, I I can never get ahead or I'm not a thing, but. I know you're the kind of um, school of thought, correct me if wrong, you, you really have no desire to own a residential property, right? You, you, you're you happy making no. you know money investing in other ways. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, uh, there are several paths to, to wealth, you know, if you want to build it and you can rent. I mean, look, if, if I wanted to be mortgage free, if I could save, um, say I paid $1,500 a month in rent, mm-hmm. uh, which is low, let's say 2000 a month. in rent. Mm-hmm. Um, so 2000 a month, if I had an investment that could earn me, say that investment um, was, uh, I built that up to $300,000, right? Which is, you know, renting, typically you're paying less than when you own a home. Um, so you can kind of split the difference, put that money away, um, get yourself, that, that earns interest within, you know, six, seven, eight years, you've got this kind of investment. That investment can generate interest that can pay your rent. And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden I'm, Granted, it's a rental property. I don't own it, but I am, for lack, for all intents and purposes, I'm mortgage free at that mm-hmm. point. So there's you can get creative with numbers and and build the life you want. It's not the white picket fence thing is kind of old. <laughs> yeah. I don't, That's not happening. I don't. Yeah, it's not in Toronto anyway. You know, you want to move out to New Brunswick or you want to go like rural Manitoba. Uh, yeah, Manitoba, something like that. If you had the ability to do that, you can get houses there for, um, uh, you know, geez, eighty, ninety thousand dollars for a fixer upper, um, which is insane compared to Toronto, which is mm-hmm. you know fifteen to twenty times more. Mm-hmm. Now, do you think? Um, I know it's obviously nobody has a crystal ball, but obviously there's a lot of discussion on you know, sir being handed out and low interest rates. Uh, now, you know, the next, you know, couple of years catching up to us where people are talking about hyperinflation and possibly like a little mini recession. Uh, do you foresee that happening? Do you foresee like maybe interest rates going up and hyperinflation kind of occurring? Um, um, I, I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> mm. um, I don't really know uh, the answer to that. I, the interest rate has to go up eventually that's just kind of the life cycle of interest rates Mm -hmm. um so we remain uh, competitive internationally um but i mean i don't know for sure i i I don't know if that would lead to hyper i hope it won't lead to hyperinflation um you know covid has accelerated some some costs and it's not inflation it's more just a lack of supply um but those you know those goods could stay up you know, those, because people are paying it and the demand is still there, Mm -hmm. you know, those goods may not come back down, which might lead to actual inflation. Um, But from, from, uh, from the long-term economic standpoint, like I don't see houses prices actually going down. um, You don't think it even possibly a small, like little correction once interest rates go back up? No, look, they have, they have it. The eighties, you know, interest rates hit 18% and it, it, all it did was slow down the 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 price like people were losing their homes everywhere right you could get a deal on a house if you you know got it through the bank power of sale all that but back then um um and that that was a perfect example of you know if you raise the interest rates too high you know people are going to lose their homes Mm -hmm. and i think the government for the most part has kind of learned that lesson Mm -hmm. um but uh as far as values property values it didn't slow down the property values, especially mm-hmm. in I, urban I guess centers. the rich still have their money, right? It's like people that well, can Well, the rich afford- still have their money yeah. and, and there's equity tied in. Um, so if you, if you can handle the, the increases, um, you're, 
you know, you're, you want it to maintain the revenue in your home, right? You don't want mm-hmm. it to necessarily go down. And I don't think given the value of, and at Toronto is, I guess the main, that's really what I know the main sampling of. And it's probably not fair to think of all of Canada in the terms of Toronto or Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the last hundred years, prices never went down on housing. Like that's ever. amazing. It just doesn't mm-hmm. happen. Um, and so given that, even though there's, you know, there are media articles I've read that says, oh, the, the house prices are going to go down. This song has been spouted, you know, time and time again through a history and it's, yeah. it's just never happened. So that, I prefer to believe in what has happened will kind of maintain, not, not what the media is kind of putting out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My father used to say it's the the one thing that God doesn't make anymore. So it's a, a somewhat finite uh, resource is land, right? Yeah, it is. Oh, for sure. Yeah, we we have it all. It's all it's all taken. So <laughs> you're getting it from somebody else, and and that's it. Yeah, you're right. It is finite. It's interesting. It's very fascinating because I think, like I said, for me, I was never really interested in economics and all that stuff. But now it's kind of I, I I'm forced to be interested in it because it affects my business and. You know, kind oh, of yeah, talk about yeah. minimum wage, all that stuff. It's like, it's tough. It's very man. important. Like, it's very important to know what's going on, even in the government. And mm-hmm. you know, it's it's as a business owner, um, you want to be part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm a member of the Canadian uh, Federation of Independent Businesses, as, as is you know, eight hundred thousand other small businesses. Is that like They're the like, federation from Star Wars? Is that a similar federation? No, like, uh, no, no. no. You wear helmets and oh, okay. they're, they're a lobby. Maybe wore cool, cool helmets or something. Walked around. That would that would be awesome. That would be amazing. <laughs> no, no, they're a lobby group. They but they will they lobby they advocate on behalf of small businesses to the government. Nice. So and that's important because just being a member, you you at least you get to participate to a point in the conversation. Like you have an ear to the ground kind of with what's happening, right. With other businesses. Yeah. They give us newsletters to, you know, things that specifically affect small businesses. So they're kind of scanning through all the nonsense that's out there in the media. um, Cause they're a part of the discussion, right. They're, Mm -hmm. they're at the table with the government. Um, They're, they're, they're constantly putting out, you know, they're quoted in media all the time. the, The, the guys that are part of the lobby themselves, um, but they, they are kind of our advocating group, uh, on behalf of the government. Thank God they're there. Um, cause otherwise, you know, small business would have gone a while ago. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how the, the, the future of, of small business, like I'm, you know, not to go back into COVID, it feels like it's just so hard to <laughs> avoid that conversation because it affects so many different things, personal lives, business. And, you know, I've seen it in just in my area in Mississauga. I'm not sure how much it's affected uh, your area, Chris, but I've seen mm-hmm. so many small businesses that like bars and and uh, little restaurants or whatever closed down. Um, and, you know, you, you try to support them as much as you can, but, you know, you can't be eating out every single day. You know, you got to, no. like we were talking about, no. you got to save money for your future too, right? But it's yeah. it's really it's really sad. And um, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Like, I mean, you, you, you just hope for the most part that we're at the tail end of this thing. I know, um, you know, some people think we're just kind of getting started and we're going to have another wave again. And But it's, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's, it's you, you do what you can to support them. And I think it's important for, like for me, as much as possible, I think you think the same. I, I like to support other small businesses. Like if I can, you know, buy, uh, you know, even clothing for my for my business from instead of buying it from a big company, if I can support a, a local vendor here or something, I kind of yeah. feel good about it. Um, yeah. But it, it's tough sometimes, right? Because we're all cost sensitive, and and you know. Well, in, in the pandemic, has I think affected a lot of people emotionally as well. Um, well, especially people who have lost, you know, loved ones. And, and mm-hmm, whatnot. Mm-hmm. But with with anything like where there's a major change in uh, economics. And it's sad to see, you know, small businesses um, go out. Uh, a lot of restaurants have closed because of the pandemic. Um, but people are still spending money. Their needs have just changed. So now they're they're not going out to a restaurant, but maybe they're ordering takeout and whatnot. So the takeout businesses are thriving as mm-hmm. a result. Like one pizza, pizza companies and the ones that, uh, you know, skip the dishes and, 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 DoorDash and all of those guys, uh, they're making a killing right on that. Um, because you can't go to restaurants and a lot of people, you know, I, myself included, I love, I love my takeout, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, um, so the, but, but there's also, um, a lot of industries that are, that are flourishing, 
um, which is sad because it's a pandemic. But I mean, mm-hmm. this is just the reality is that people's when people's habits change, it's disruptive because money comes out of one person's pocket and starts moving into another. So you and I both know, Rob, the home mm-hmm. construction industry is booming right now Yeah, because everyone's at home uh, looking at their four walls, wishing they had a better place. So mm-hmm. they're renovating and they're, you know, adding things to their backyard and, and it's, it's improving the, uh, um, uh, that industry, um, as the restaurant industry is suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and also people at home are able to, like I said before, um, they're able to maybe explore opportunities that they wouldn't have been able to, uh, before because mm-hmm. the, you know, the EI, um, measures are, are, or either you know too stringent. Uh, uh, anyway, it's uh, it's definitely a, a, a strange time. <laughs> it's it's uh, yeah. Like now, I'm wondering too. Like after this, is this uh, you know are we going to see um, a lot more? You know, the ones that have survived, right? Like the great. Mm-hmm. That, you know, if they can stay open and kind of just hold on. Hopefully, I, I think my my sentiment is that uh, kind of the public. Um, demeanor at this point is everybody kind of just wants to get it back to normal you know whether you're mm-hmm. pro-vax or anti-vax i think everybody just wants to go back to normal right and and socialize again i think hopefully if we're back open again this summer like fully and and um i think you're going to see a lot of social events i think people are just missing being around you know, there's some people obviously that are still a little bit worried and want to you know kind of wait till maybe you know still be safe and i think for the next probably Five years, maybe more. You're, you're still going to have a big uh, majority of the population wearing masks when they're out. Maybe they're still thing. Even if masks aren't main- mandated, it might be like, you know, Asia. I know uh, certain parts yeah. of Asia, they're still, yeah. whenever you travel on the subway or whatever, it's just kind of common courtesy. So maybe it's going to become like that. But I sure. think people, for the most part, are ready to go back to normal. They want to socialize again. They want to support their small businesses. Um, so I, I remember even like here in Mississauga for the couple weeks or month, whatever, when businesses were allowed to open again, people were just flooding the restaurants, right? Which is which is nice to see because you know you want to be able to support these kind of pillars of um, of your community and, and these kind of landmark restaurants and and places that um, are great to, to be at. But um, I, well, I guess my question was: Do you think that um, maybe people uh, considering starting a business in restaurant or whatever are going to be a little bit? trigger shy given this past pandemic or maybe it's the best opportunity to start a bar after after the pandemic i think i think both could be right um i think that i think that uh we're there's definitely there's definitely an opportunity should should everything go back to normal 100 percent or even even remotely close um there's going to be that demand there for restaurants that is going to be underserved because of you know, number you know, the thousand plus restaurants that have gone out of business, um, just in Ontario. But um, I'm not. Uh, it it all depends if it goes back to that normal. If I was to look at look at a restaurant, I would consider heavily there being a delivery element to it, mm. um, just because that you know people's habits. We've been in the pandemic for for over two years now, mm-hmm. and some of the habits that we're building, we're going to probably keep some of those habits even after the pandemic is gone, just because now it's become, was it, it's a hundred days, something, you know, when something it's becomes a habit, habit. Yeah. yeah, it's a hundred days. And then something, well, we've been, we're six times past that. So, you know, maybe going to restaurants might be less common for a lot of people. Maybe they'll prefer to have the takeout here. Um, you know, you know, I, you know, I, I set up my projector here. Mm-hmm. We, we bought a projector here in the house so we could do movie nights here. So as a result, and, and that's because of the pandemic, but even after the pandemic, I'm probably going to go to the theater a lot less mm-hmm. because I'll be honest, can just... I would pay to come to your place and watch a movie. Yeah. Guys. Have a pretty <laughs> sweet setup and, yeah. He's got a pretty sweet setup. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's a nice projector. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, um, but, but that, that will maintain. But, you know, Chris, one thing that, or Rob, everyone, I, for that matter, I think one thing that's changing is what is the normal, right? I mean, we're talking about going back to normal, but it's been over, as you said, it's been over two years. So technically speaking, the normal no longer exists for us, you know? I no. think 
it's, you know, the one thing that I see personally, just working in the digital spaces, there, there's an influx of usage online now. And I think, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be this hands-free world that we're living in, you know, gone are the days where, you know, we're physically going to be commuting to, you know, eat out. Well, I'm not saying that's going to go away, but I think that will be something of the past for the vast majority. Because as you said, you know, we've all got accustomed to ordering in, watching our own movies at home, you know, doing everything in the comfort of our living room or bedroom or, or what have you. So I think the normal is being redefined right now, which isn't always a bad thing. Of mm, course, no. it's a bad thing if you're being affected by it. But I think, you know, the normal is currently in the process of being redefined. So we don't know what that normal is. But I think eventually, you know, it's not going to be what it was on February 2020. I can tell you that much, right? Um, I agree. I agree yeah. completely. Yeah, I think you're going to have certain people. It's funny that I think you're going to have various degrees of of that, where some people are still going to be really worried, and you know, like like uh, you know, my stepmom's family, her parents are really you know kind of worried, and they stay home pretty much majority of the time. They're also 95, so you know, you understand that, right? They they they, mm-hmm. they kind of don't want to take any chances. Um, but I think you're going to have another you know set of people. I'm kind of one of them that is excited to get back out there and socialize again. And I want to, I want to support uh, small business as much as I can and go, you know, part of, part of the, you know, the, the best memories I have from, um, you know, my, my time with friends and stuff and socializing is going to bars or going to live music or going to events. Mm-hmm. And I think you're going to have a, a lot of people that are just ready to do that again, because we've all been cooped up for so long. Um, so I think hopefully the businesses that have held on and have been able to stay open, uh, hopefully we'll, you know, see a huge, uh, wave back who knows that they're they might never make back what they lost but um i think you will see an uptick a little bit i think you're right um you're definitely right for existing businesses um uh, going back to the question though of uh opening a restaurant uh versus versus having one mm-hmm. already that my concern I, I don't believe going back to the habit thing as well is i i don't necessarily believe that it's going to come back to what the market was before yeah. COVID, uh, just because habits have over, it, it will bounce back. There will be more, obviously, than right now because everything's mm-hmm. closed. But, um, um, and because a bunch of the restaurants closed, we have to go. You know, we have to kind of we have less choices, right? So we, have, so those those businesses are going to do well. I, I have no doubt in my mind that they're going to do well. Um, but to repopulate the restaurant scene, I don't think it's going to come back as as you know as grand as you might think i think it's going to be um you know i I don't think getting into the restaurant industry and and i had actually looked at some numbers i had thought about you know maybe getting a small restaurant uh uh moving because of covid because it's you know looking at the numbers it seemed like Mm -hmm. yeah this is good but because it's gone on so long now i don't know Mm -hmm. that uh it's going to bounce back quite as strong as as we will 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 hope it will I think what you might see um, is, and I guess only time will tell, is that almost an unequal proportion of revenue um, that happens after COVID, where I think certain businesses uh, are going to do uh, very well. Like, you know, I've been fortunate enough, like Chris, you said, we know that um, renovation and, and home service industry has been great. Everybody's stuck at home and wanted to renovate. I think yeah. you're going to have certain restaurants and certain bars do really, really well. And then you're going to have other uh, businesses just um, close if they haven't already, or maybe be even in the future kind of start to slowly die. Like I, I was thinking about just the other day, like uh, I grew up um, taking jujitsu and doing martial arts. And it was the one thing I love, but are people going to be a little bit hesitant now of rolling around and, 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 and throwing <laughs> sweaty people around yeah. and being close to people again. Right. I think <laughs> you might see a lot of martial arts places um, start to, to dwindle off. I don't know. I don't know. It's going to be, yeah. I, I can tell you, I get one of the things that I don't think is going to go away. And this is a small example is that when I get in an elevator and yeah. there's somebody without, without a mask on in the elevator mm-hmm. yeah. or it's a really crowded elevator. That just um, happened to me. Yeah. Just happened to me. I, I get uncomfortable mm-hmm. as a result. And and I don't think after the pandemic, I don't think that's going to change because you know, it, it's, I, it's some stranger is breathing on me <laughs> now. It's no, but, but seriously, that's it's now true, a yeah. thought. Because of COVID and because it's been going on for so long now, yeah. it's just something I, I feel is going to stick 
moving yeah. forward. And then you're going to have the elevators are going to go back to this is what the guys is great about COVID. It's like, wow, the elevators are so spacious now. <laughs> so yeah. nice. Um, you know, but, but we're going to go back to having 11 sweaty people in there all breathing the same air. Yeah. Um, hey, it sounds like it, a like a scene out of uh, I Am Legend zombie movies, like all these eleven but it's, sweaty people breathing. It's, it's yeah, eleven sweaty people. That could <laughs> yeah. be a good movie. Uh, yeah, title. yeah. <laughs> you know, eleven sweaty people in an elevator. That's funny. It's just Rob. It's just weird because I just experienced this last night. I had a I had to get my haircut actually, and um, my buddy of mine he has his business operating out of, out of his condominium, and I get there. And I see a line out the door and I'm wondering, okay, why is there a line out the door of his, of the lobby of his condominium? And lo and behold, it's because, well, the elevator can only hold three people maximum. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and you had Uber Eats lining up. It was literally chaos just, to, just to navigate. And it's, you know, that, that part of it is kind of confusing to me, right? I mean, not confusing as to why it's happening, but more so confusing as to, you know, what's going to happen when, we get back to normal, which kind of shifts to what I mentioned earlier is, is there even going to be a, a normal that we had before? So this is kind of, yeah, mm-hmm. it's, you know, the whole elevator concept is kind of like the, an example of this whole entire experience that we're going through as a whole. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's um, crazy times. Um, what else can we talk about? Oh, back to kind of a little bit more. We're kind of, we'll try to keep it, to around an hour off, or so. off topic here a little bit. Yeah, I know. That's the thing is like, you know, when you have good people on the call, it just kind of, you go on to off wherever the combo takes you. Right. Um, but back to kind of a little bit about minimum wage and, and small business and stuff. Now, um, do you think Chris, like for minimum wage, cause um, I, I struggle with this for a little bit where it's like, I want to pay my subcontractors or my helpers, you know, what I feel like is a fair wage, but obviously being a small business owner, you know, I can't, you know, pay give the shirt off my back because then you're just not profitable that's just silly right yeah. so yeah. do you feel yeah. uh, that uh, uh, the raise for example in the minimum wage affects more small business or it's lo- it's large business because you'd think like okay yeah obviously uh from just first glance it would affect more small business but you know the, the small business is a bit more nimble and and able to pivot a lot quicker than than large business mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. i don't know i don't know the answer you're 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 um Selecting a, a wage for your your staff is it's it's tricky because you actually you, do, you you know you you've got numbers that you need to balance um, and you don't want to pay too much either you know you can you can run into uh, problems you know so if you pay somebody thirty dollars an hour they're gonna when you first do it they're gonna be so happy that you paid them thirty dollars yeah. an hour mm-hmm. um, but a year later. Um, you're going to come to a, a point where they 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 will either want more mm-hmm. or which because everybody kind of wants to grow right in some mm-hmm. way shape or form, um, or they'll they'll view uh, anything less as being you know completely sub subpar. It's like no, mm-hmm. I can't do that for less than you know. 30 or 32 or 34 and mm-hmm. you know people people forget what you give them and they remember what you take away in a lot it's of it's interesting cases. human nature right it's I, i've yeah, experienced just, that even on a small level where it's you know not to name any names but i've had you know helpers and subcontractors where you know i try to the, the one good thing i think about minimum wage is that it, it almost sets a little bit of a of a baseline even though it's not you know, we all kind of agree it's not enough money it's not um, enough money, it's, yeah. it's good to say okay like i'm gonna pay my employee five, 10 bucks more than minimum wage. Cause I, that's something I can afford and every business is different and I feel good about that. And it's like, mm-hmm. you know, it's a little bit of a compromise and I think somewhere in between, but you're right. I've had experiences where even though I'm paying a bit more for, for maybe an unskilled labor, just very basic general, um, mm-hmm. a job that kind of anybody could do. Um, and th- you know, I've had people come back to me and say, no, sorry, that's not enough. I need more. And it's, it's tough because I, I've been on the receiving end of that too. I never, <clears throat> when we first met Chris, you know, it's still funny. It's a funny story how sometimes fates are just, you're, you're, you're always one decision away sometimes in life from your life taking a, a totally different turn. Big and time, I'm very happy time. that uh, I, um, I met you, Chris, because uh, Andre, you probably don't know this, but Chris had reached out to me originally on an email saying, Hey man, uh, I see you have an ad for, I think I was oh, posting on Kijiji at the time trying to, you know, it was Kijiji. Yeah. yeah, get whatever business yeah. I could. And Chris reached out 
And I'm like, who's this guy? This guy sounds like it's a waste of time. I'm not even going to respond back. Right. And I'm like, you know, my gut's like, you know what? It's better to do and say, wish I didn't than, than to don't right, do and exactly. wish I did. So I'm like, I always try to say yes first and then try it out. If it doesn't work, you walk away. So um, thankfully, I, I, you know, I, uh, I messaged back. We met. Um, Chris was nice enough actually to give me a second chance because the first time we were supposed to meet, my wholeheartedly, my my car window got smashed in. I was staying in Hamilton. I remember. I remember that. Uh, yeah. yeah, and um, I, I had to cancel just because I, you know, my car which was, was which was funny because I was on my end going, "Who's this guy? He just yeah, trying exactly. to get out of the meeting. What a guy!" <laughs> I yeah. don't blame you. I don't blame just you, right? And a yeah. lot of people would have been discounted because you know, there's a lot of bad contractors out there and. I probably would even too if somebody kind of like you know just I felt was wasting time. But anyways, uh, fast forward now, I'm glad. Thankfully, it uh, you know you gave me a second chance and it worked out. And we have a great friendship now and it, kind of a, a business relationship. Um, mm-hmm. And I went off ta- I went off topic for a second. I forgot where I was going with that, but I think I was just going to oh yeah about about wages. Wage. And yeah. I know when I first started learning the kind of awnings more, I, I kind of knew a little bit uh, about installs when I met you, but. You were nice enough to hook me up with Jacques. Uh, Jacques taught me a lot, and I started from him. Well, you know, just eighteen bucks an hour, and I was fine with that because for me, I, I guess I, I'm I'm okay paying my dues to to learn. And for me, it was a way to be like, okay, you know what? I'm going to be basically paid to be in school. It's almost like yeah, it's education tax. Yeah, and, I'm learning. Yeah. The, the great thing about apprenticeships in general, it, more 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 industries should do apprentice training. I think it's fan, it's a fantastic way to school is through mm-hmm, apprenticeships. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's more direct. So I don't know if everybody's like that. Maybe I'm I'm an outlier because I I saw it as an investment in my future business, and then slowly I you know worked up to making more, and then you know running my own show and all that kind of stuff. So well, it's different when when you you're the owner. If you're working for a company, maybe you know you're you're learning something. But unless you're planning on leaving that company and going starting your own, you know, as a competitor, you're not you're not really. You know, your, your wage is really all you get from that business, right? And hopefully some, you know, sense of pride and, and you know, there's a lot of other things that, that people do, you know, work for and enjoy working for, not just the money, but, um, but that's that, but the money is really, you know, the kind of the, the, the common denominator there. Everyone has to make some money because everyone has bills to pay. Right? Yes. So, Yes. And I, and, I think uh, it's, I, I don't know the solution. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of a middle ground between different things, but the, the one kind of, um, uh, I don't think call it solution or a or, or resolution that I've kind of determined is really just everybody trying to increase their skill set as much as possible, because I don't think anybody will argue that, you know, uh, what a lawyer gets paid or what a doctor gets paid because, you know, they go to school for several years to, to, uh, uh increase their skill set and increase their knowledge base and then they are rewarded uh, financially because of that. So I think if more, if we all just kind of focus on increasing our skill set, where you you bring more value, because I'm a true believer of you, you get paid on the value you bring the marketplace, whether you're a business or your employee, whatever. Um, and I think if you, if even if you're an employee, if you work on increasing your skill set and making an argument to your employer to say, hey, I think I deserve you know more because of A, B, C, D. Um, and I'm bringing more money. You can show that you're bringing more money into the business because of your skill set. I think that's totally justified. But I think if somebody's just asking for more because time has passed and it's like I'm doing a very, you know, um, low skill job, so to speak, I, 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 I have a problem with that. Yeah, it, it's it's hard. I mean, really, it comes down to, um, you know, the whole like, the concept of minimum wage at its core, the design of it. It's supposed to be what we what the bare minimum required is to survive yeah. in in our province right and 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 we've already touched that it's different for region and everything else but um it like i cannot see any downside aside from you know the the media rhetoric and 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 the the, the you know for bitching and moaning for yeah. lack of a better term if you raise uh the minimum wage to a living wage um I think surprisingly the fallout would be would be pretty low. Um there wouldn't be a lot of businesses wouldn't start shutting down overnight and mm. you know that we may get a couple of examples where that's going to happen. Yeah. Um but also the government needs to uh do it slowly at the same time. You can't go okay now minimum it's $15 an hour now it's 22. Yes. 
because that is going to be very disruptive to businesses. Mm -hmm. But a dollar, you know, every few years until we get to the right level, um, I I think it should happen. I I can't see any, I can't think of a business that would be, would, it would make or break them um, that isn't already on the way out anyway Mm -hmm. by raising a dollar, you know, every three years or so. Yeah. So I we have to pay a little bit more. It, we have to pay a little bit more for our burrito or for our, you know, our coffee. I don't want to um, pay thirty more cents for my burrito. I want a thirty right, cent yeah. discount. That actually happened in the U.S. <laughs> where they had a minimum wage increase, and there was this huge story about how the burritos were thirty cents more, and that so the 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 state I can't remember what state it was, but they they basically forced out like a new minimum wage increase, and it was pretty dramatic, and um. And and the entire like, up in arms about burrito they because the, the the burrito co- I can't remember which company it was either Mucho Burrito maybe okay um they they uh, they just freaked out right and they 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 put out a public statement saying well these are going up because your government made it happen and the news media just ate it up and the whole focus wasn't on oh hey man this is good for for oh my god the people and and good none of that it was about the burrito going up 30 cents <laughs> just it it boggles my mind how the media can take uh such a profound act that you know and a good act on the government's behalf and just turn it into this nonsense. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And I think it happens too when it's, it's kind of like the boiling frog analogy when you're, like you said, if you're doing it, you know, 50 cents a year or a dollar a year over the course of several years, it's not as much as a pain because I, 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 I agree. I think that if you're structuring your business properly, a dollar here, a dollar there shouldn't matter. You should have good margins on your business and maybe look at your price points and service offerings to, to make it more profitable. If, you, if, you, if you're worried about a dollar increase, I think, like you said, you're on your way out anyways, and you're probably not running yeah. your business properly. But I think if when it happens where it's like hasn't been done for five years uh, or more, and then it's like a $5 increase or whatever, it's it's a mo- more dramatic, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it, it. Any business needs one of the most important things for businesses is predictability and nothing too extreme happening that changes things. Right. That's why the pandemic is is so damaging to businesses, a lot of businesses, because it was an immediate change in how we had to do everything, and then businesses just weren't ready for it, and a lot of them. A lot of them that may have been, you know, maybe on the struggling or on the verge, you know, they're just gone, right? And then a lot more kind of followed because of how how prolonged, you know, the whole thing is. So interesting but, uh, stuff. Interesting stuff. Well, yeah, I think we're pretty much at an hour now. I think that uh, it's funny how fast time flies. So uh, I think yeah, we'll yeah. probably start to wrap it up. But uh, Chris, man, thank you so much for for being on the uh, episode with us. I wanted to uh, definitely get you on. And I uh, really pleasure. appreciate uh, you taking the time. Again, if anybody needs amazing awnings or shade products, check out <laughs> CanadianShade.ca. They do uh, amazing, beautiful stuff. And Thank I install you. for them too. So, you know, this is my way as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, guys. Uh, we'll enjoy the rest of you, your uh, Sunday. That. Thanks so much, oh, My Chris. pleasure. My pleasure. And uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Please like and subscribe, share our stuff. We're really trying to to grow and kind of support uh, Canadian businesses and Canadian content. So uh, thank you for listening and uh, we'll see everybody next week.